Look how I play video games. This should just stop making video games for like a year. Let me catch up. There's <laughs> all these video games out there. You know, I, I can't play them. I'm too busy playing all these games I already played. Here's one of them. Arx Fatalis is a first-person action RPG immersive sim human rat simulator created by French developer Arcane Studios and published by Joe Wood Productions for PC in 2002 and Dreamcatcher Interactive for Xbox in 2003. This was the first game developed by Arcane Studios, now known for franchises like Dishonored and Prey. Arx Fatalis was originally penned as a direct sequel to 1993's Ultima Underworld 2 Labyrinth of Worlds from Looking Glass studios. This was an idea born from Arcane founder Rafael Colantonio, a fledgling game designer who unwittingly began working for EA as a QA tester after winning an Ultima Trivia Contest, a contest that promised the winner a trip to Origins Texas office to play Ultima 8 Pagan. This was revealed to be a complete fabrication as the real purpose of the contest was to suss out passionate gamers to staff a new office EA was opening. Oh, you wanted to play our video game? Get the fuck out! Oh. Not as exciting, but it does give him a job and helps him avoid mandatory military service in France. While he did get to work to some degree on titles like System Shock, he saw the shift EA was making to focus more on consoles and its library of sports titles, neglecting Origin's output, which was what spurred him to enter that contest in the first place. After leaving EA, he went to Infograms, where I doubt the work was much more fulfilling. It did teach him how to manage a small team of developers, successfully shipping 90 1999's The Smurfs for PS1, which looks like this. Arcane was formed within the same year with 11 members and a loan from an uncle. When planning to make a sequel to Ultima Underworld, it seemed logical to reach out to Looking Glass Studios, who owned half the rights to the IP. Paul Nirath, the creative director of Ultima Underworld, was shown a build of their game and essentially had Ultima Underworld 3 pitched to him, and he fully endorsed it, loving the idea enough to agree to set up a meeting with EA, who owned the other half of the IP. As is often the case with development stories for games I like, EA usually winds up being the monster at the end of the story. They were not interested in making the game unless considerable changes were made to it. Not wanting to compromise the vision of this game, Colantonio refused EA's terms and dropped any references to Ultima, retitling the game Arx Fatalis. I think we can probably guess what notes EA would have given to Arcane. They are evidenced in the criticism leveled at the final mainline Ultima game, which was described as rushed, unfinished, and pandering to a more general audience. Three or so years later, Arx Fatalis was finished, but Arcane was on the brink of bankruptcy after difficulties finding a publisher for their first game, with Joe Wood bailing them out at the last minute after their first option went bankrupt as the papers were being filed. Arx Fatalis was finally released and received a near-universal pretty good from critics. Computer Gaming World would name it the most original RPG not named Morrowind released in 2002, which is the appropriate amount of backhandedness, I think. In any case, despite positive critic reception and a couple awards won, Arx Fatalis was undeniably a commercial failure. It simply did not sell, sparkling like a glorious jewel in a damp, labyrinthine cavern beneath a gaming landscape that was honestly full of a lot of things to play. 2002 was not a bad year in gaming, especially if you're a fan of western RPGs and smelly dirty boy games. The saving grace was that two publishers, Ubisoft and Bethesda, saw potential in the young dev team and both offered an opportunity to make a game with them. I like to think this moment created a branching path in time, two splintered dimensions, one where Arcane agrees to Ubisoft's terms and another where they sign with Bethesda. If you're you're watching this video that means you currently exist in the Ubisoft timeline, where unfortunately Ubisoft has arisen to join the axis of gaming alongside EA and Activision Blizzard, but also Arcane chose Ubisoft to align with out of further fear of bankruptcy, and their work on Arx Fatalis 2 was reshaped to fit into the existing Might and Magic franchise, culminating in 2006's Dark Messiah of Might and Magic, also known as the Kick Game, where you play as the Kick Man, kicking around Kick World, kicking things 
things kick and stuff. Kick, kick, kick. Arcane is seemingly doing quite well for themselves as of late, with a stream of well-liked titles and only the occasional misstep. Origin, the spiritual influence behind Arcane, consumed into the maw of EA with the lifeless corpse of their flagship franchise, manipulated through strings to appear on ephemeral mobile and browser games. Though after the failure of these ventures, the body was unceremoniously thrown in a dumpster. The video game industry respecting art since I'd like to get this out of the way. Uh, for some reason, Shadowplay thought it would be cool to record the status indicator on my entire playthrough of the game. I hate it. Just seeing it infuriates me. But we're just gonna have to live with it because, I don't know, my devotion to quality can only go so far. Arx Fatalis, Latin for Fatal Fortress, is set in a world that is definitely not Britannia, but instead called Exhausta. And like, cut me some slack because this is a lot of fantasy jargon. I just know I'm gonna fuck up. I barely have wikis to lean on because nobody bothers to compile it all anywhere. Hopefully that also means it won't be fact-checked. <laughs> Uh, this is a relatively standard high fantasy setting with all the races and creatures one would expect, though the tone of the setting is noticeably more drab and dreary. It's a world that lost its sun mysteriously following the appearance of a meteor that collided with the planet, turning the landscape of the surface frozen and near inhospitable, with only a handful of settlements holding out, but mostly cut off from each other. The Kingdom of Arx is one of these surviving settlements, and in the days leading up to the sun's extinguishing, human Humans, dwarves, snake women, rat men, goblins, and trolls all temporarily put their differences aside to transfer arcs beneath the surface, retreating into vast underground tunnel systems created by dwarves. This alliance didn't last long after the migration. With each race allotted their own level of the tunnel system, many of the old grudges and conflicts began to return as a result of the cramped quarters and shortages of resources and resource sorted and resource shortages, which is the fucking stupidest phrase. We got shortages of resources. Fulfilling one of two possible Western RPG origins, you play as a nameless amnesiac who awakes in a goblin prison. The other possible origin, by the way, is go f yourself. To avoid having everyone in the world give you a vague placeholder pseudonym like traveler, warrior, hero, chosen one, and so forth, your cellmate decides, hey, you don't have a name, so I'm just gonna give you one, and it's Amshagar, which means he who has no name. Okay, I feel like I should be responsible for naming myself, but okay. Arx Fatalis is a pretty open-ended game, so there are a lot of choices you could make or events you could choose to partake in or ignore, but if you wanted to, you and Koltar could bust out of the goblin prison and make your way back to level 1, which is where the human kingdom resides. Before he makes it there, the first sign of human life is an outpost that was mostly wiped out after an attack by the Ilsids, a mysterious and powerful group of soldiers that with this attack have officially declared war with Arx. The wounded survivors of the attack plea with Amshagar to inform the king, and our hero couldn't give a shit. Find someone else to help, I have my own problems to deal with. Like, where you gotta be, dude? You gotta work in the morning? When we make it back to humanity, the king thanks you for informing them of the attack, but it turns out this attack is a drop in the bucket as far as ominous portents. As of late, a recent string of occult rituals have been taking place around the kingdom, and the dangerous cult responsible has been growing in number. The kingdom's astronomer, Fallon Orbaplanix, was murdered, likely because he was pulling at the threads of this conspiracy and because nobody likes saying his name. Am Shagar is pulled into investigating these events, no longer fighting the reality that he just seems drawn to helping others, uh, no matter how much he seems to hate it. It seems I can't escape being drawn into these events. Well, I shall help you. This is all somewhat confusing, your majesty but I could certainly look into it. If you'd like to experience the story yourself and not be told spoilers for a game that's about 20 years old now, go ahead and skip to this time. If not, then feel free to stick around and live out your gaming experiences vicariously through someone else. I'm like the blanket-wrapped, atrophied ghoul that offers you this small comfort in exchange for the means to carry on like this. Open up the cracker. Open up the crack. Ah! Uh, yes? Hey! Uh, hello, sir, can I help you? You is dead soon! Okay, 
Oh, well, that's good. But can I finish talking about this video game first? It's an immersive sim, so that means it's empirically a good game. Huh? Immersive sim. What that? Like Thief or Deus Ex? Thief! Yeah, I did a video on that one. Me saw that. Oh, yeah, what did you think? You say lies. You <laughs> is just too stupid for me. Listen, work. you little shit. Omshigar goes around the kingdom questioning people about the death of Fallon Orbiplanix. Who is Fallon Orbiplanix? Fallon was our astronomer. He died a few days ago. I'm investigating the rituals and the death of Fallon Orbiplanix. That's convenient, seeing as you didn't know who he was a second ago. Who was Fallon Orbiplanix? It's just like, do you care about any of this shit, dude? Like, I'm in this, are you? He eventually digs up Fallon's journal, and the king calls a round table of his advisors to discuss the findings. Okay, this is like the largest info dump in the game, and in any game ever, and I had to watch this cutscene like three times, but the journal reveals that Fallon had determined that the recent rash of occult rituals were the work of the followers of Akba, an evil and destructive god, with some members being spies within the kingdom. A sect of this cult worships and makes sacrifices to a fragment of a meteorite called Kol which supposedly holds some connection to how Akba was born. The cult is using this to slowly siphon magic energy to Akba so he can be incarnated in arcs. Before his murder, Fallon had managed to contact an astral alternate dimension of sorts called the Noden, a place where celestial beings sort of maintain a balance of power with the elements. In response to this situation, the Noden would have sent something called a Guardian, a powerful godlike being with the task of driving out rogue gods and breaking unauthorized connections to the Noden. So Amshagar is tasked with finding the Guardian as he is the only one who could destroy the cultic stone and break the flow of power to Akba. So he's given a piece of the meteorite to help him. What? Uh. Holy shit. So when Amshagar touches the stone, he partially regains his memory and has a flashback to the Noden, where this being named Master Slib explains that no god is allowed to leave the Noden, and the only way Akba will be able to have enough power to do so is through the adulation of his followers. So Slib sends you to Arks to destroy the cult of Akba and the cultic stone so Akba can't leave the Noden. What an exhausting sentence. Slib also explains that the process of being being transported to other worlds is really taxing on a guardian's memory, which is a decent enough hand wave for that. That means that Um Shigar is the guardian. It all makes sense to me now, and especially his constant desire to help others. Well, I shall help you. Are we talking about the same guy? Does it? Does nobody else see this? Am I the asshole? The Guardian tracks down the cultic stone to get rid of it, only to find out that the cult of Akba is actively attempting to sacrifice a woman to the stone, and this procession is being led by Aserbius, an astronomer within the Kingdom of Arcs, who is revealed to be the one directly responsible for Fallon's murder back when he went by the name Sweebris. So Sweebris was really Aserbius. Sweeb. Sub. Sweebris was really Aserbius the whole time and had cleverly disguised himself by saying his name backwards an infallible stratagem if ever there was one unfortunately amshigar is unable to destroy the stone it instead drains his power and sends it to akba which is very much the opposite sort of thing uh, that we were than the thing we we're going for. The king and his advisor deduce that in order to get close enough to the stone and destroy it, the guardian will need a powerful magical artifact that shields from draining magic. And then on top of that, they need to construct the most powerful weapon known to man. And that's the only thing that can defeat Akba should he enter arcs through Iserbius. The only problem is that this artifact is separated into two rings called Krahas and Zohart that can't function at full capacity unless they're together. One of these rings is in the hands of the Order of Durnium, the snake women who essentially introduced magic to humanity and have a contentious history with humans, and the others in the hands of a rebel group that stole the ring along with the king's infant daughter several years ago while his father Poxelis was king. I do like the touch of political intrigue uh, amongst the factions in this game. It's not super developed, but there is a decent amount going on besides the standard fantasy game business. There's always one or two more layers to the narrative than I'd expect there to be. There is a coup 
developing between the Snake Women, and the King's daughter is alive and leading the rebels, but by a treaty devised before she was born, she is meant to be given to the Snake Women in exchange for their use of their ring. There's a lot going on, and a few different ways these conflicts can resolve depending on how thoroughly you explore arcs and what side activities you complete. Even the fate of Koltar could make him your savior or your enemy depending on whether or not you work together. It all comes together quite cleverly. Before facing off with Asurbius and halting the incarnation of Akba, there are a handful of things you can take part in. Some expand on the main plotline, and others are just a fun distraction. You can save a little girl from being sacrificed, get a troll a birthday present, rob the local bank. It's hardly the spread of side content you're likely to see in something like an Elder Scrolls, but for what it is, it's still a marvel that there is so much packed into this game. And it's a pretty bittersweet ending. Not by any fault of Arcane, it technically just wraps itself up in a neat bow, but it's just that there is clear optimism for the future of this franchise. It's very much a wide open gate for any number of stories to continue building this world. I found myself thinking back on the experience and realizing how little I've seen and learned about Arcs and Exhausta. I get some vague sense of it through the in-game books, but they do little to quell the numerous questions I have and ideas I would like to see more of. The mere concept of these rat men fascinates me. The eerie way they communicate with each other. They seem highly intelligent and skilled in magic and assassination tactics, but you can't get a great frame of reference for their culture or lifestyle. Do they have some kind of hierarchy or goals? Anything would be great. There's a single sequence where you meet an ice dragon and you have this articulate, interesting conversation with him, and I desperately want more of that. Tell me more about the rats. Let me play as a rat. Let me be a rat. It's easy to compare Arx Fatalis to something like Morrowind, which, which I still think is unfair. This game's scale and aim is a little more tempered. It's more stripped down and small to an almost claustrophobic degree, which I think works to its benefit. It pales in comparison to the vast openness of Morrowind, but I think the setting and its greater degree of linearity allowed Arx Fatalis to make these smaller stories and hub worlds shine in a memorable way. There are tons of places and quest lines in Morrowind that I remember and I think are great, but there's also a lot of fat, which is, I guess, by design. I'm not going to criticize Morrowind, though. I don't think that's actually possible. As far as I'm concerned, it's the only reason Todd Howard hasn't been tried as a war criminal. For some reason in Arx Fatalis, I experienced at least three profound jump scares that, like, I couldn't even tell you if they were earned. But they happened, and that's relatively rare. I think a big part of it is the atmosphere and dread and its horror levels. <laughs> Alright, I'm getting TF out of here. I should probably sell all this shit I picked up. <laughs> Which are really fun. I feel like there isn't much out there with an atmosphere and tone quite like this game. There are fleeting glimpses of it in Arcane's future output, but there is something particularly cold, damp, and gloomy about the world of Arx Fatalis that really distinguishes it. I can't think of a game with goblins this endearingly dumb. Like, I love these fucking idiots. You not as clever as goblins, but me let you into Goblin City anyhow. Open gate! That disgusting human is! Oh, all right then. Everyone seems tired, afraid, or bored. Everyone's just bummed out that this is life now, which is infinitely relatable, especially now. It's a world that's gotten a taste of peace and unity through this shared plight, but that balance is rapidly declining when everyone is kind of at their worst. And there is a not small amount of horror in this game, which I do appreciate. Lots of crypts and cults and rats, which are themes I'm fond of. I don't know if theme is the right word. I like the theme of rat. You know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with that. I like the theme of rat. Arx Fatalis is a bit deceptive in that its gameplay is just as much throwback as it is modern. Even though you move freely in first-person perspective, like its spiritual progenitor, Underworld, interacting with the HUD requires you to relinquish control of the camera so you can manipulate your menus and inventory, which is similarly depicted in the classic sort of paper doll style. It's definitely something that no longer feels very intuitive, and revisiting this, Ultima, or games with similar controls like System Shock, this sort of thing might make or break your decision to see the game through to the end. Early on, I certainly found myself in frustrating situations where I'd just panic and forget all the controls. But I would say there soon comes a moment where it becomes second nature and you sort of deprogram from modern control schemes. I'm officially in sync with the early 2000s. And what a time to be alive. So much to look forward to. Legacy of Kane, the Dark Prophecy, right around the corner. Can't wait. Can't wait to see how they wrap up that franchise. I can't wait. Let me have this. Just let me see. 
I open with that as it will probably be the first thing you might find as a hurdle. At the start of the game, you choose a character model, all very plain looking dudes, which is a little disappointing as, as I wouldn't say it's important to the plot and Amshigar is a character that he is a basic dude. So obviously I went with the one with the pentagram on the head. It's something. He's got a personality, obviously. The only real trait he expresses is occasional ennui concerning his role in the proceedings. I'm here because I need Krahaus to destroy the cult of Akaba. You allot points to your four attributes and nine skills, which include obvious things like stealth, melee, spellcasting, but you also have things like intuition, which allows you to spot traps and hidden areas. Your ethereal link determines how much you know about enemies, and your object knowledge helps you identify items and determines how successful you will be at using the crafting and cooking mechanics. While there is a lot of choice in this game, none of it is dialogue based. There's no branching dialogue or anything like that. It's more action based. You can choose to fight or sneak your way through areas and factions, but you can also find some means of becoming neutral with them so they don't see you as an enemy. The first example being that early on you use a gem seller's license to pass through the goblin kingdom freely, but there isn't anything stopping you from just laying waste to them. You can also play to your strengths to find alternate ways around things, like pouring points into your technical skill to pick locks or into melee so you can just bash doors down. Combat in general is pretty serviceable for what it is, on par with if not slightly better than Morrowind's. It's, you know, you're just, you light swing and you heavy swing. The light swing's kind of useless, so it's just a timing game from there. And occasionally you'll get a critical and cleave some fucker in half, which is surprisingly satisfying. I frequently got lost in this game. Even with a relatively comprehensive map, there are hidden entrances and areas only accessible from different floors that are easy to forget and not always expressed on the map. And this is one of my greatest failings as a human being nearly tied with my willingness to eat out of the garbage. I am terrible with direction. Can't tell you how many laps I do of every level just trying to remember how I got into this one area, which knowing me there was a gate I neglected to open that would have made things easier later, but I missed it because I also have fucked eyes and I can't see the camouflaged keyholes made of three by three pixels and when i do spot it i can't find which of the 10 million keys i have that fits it because i didn't know i could buy a key ring until two thirds into this shit which took me like three days because i kept getting lost then i found a cute dog and i gave him some chicken and i thought he would be my friend but he abandoned me On the downside of combat, hitboxes can be kind of nebulous. I was frequently surprised by which hits landed and which hits missed. Even with a high ranged skill, arrows are fired as if you're underwater, making it really frustrating to try and lead shots. And at a certain point, arrows just stopped spawning in the game. I couldn't find them or buy them anymore. So near the end, I just had to give up the bow because I had used every arrow in the world apparently. But see, I feel like I can't take all the blame for this happening because arrow quivers are, for some baffling reason, replenished by being repaired. So if you use all your arrows in a quiver, it disappears. But if I had stopped before I reached my last arrow, I could have handed it to a blacksmith to repair it with more arrows. Probably something that was in the manual, but also it's really bizarre logic and now I'm sad. So there's that. How do you like that? It's game developer? Yeah, maybe that was for the best as it is really easy to cheese your way through enemies with the bow. You just get them stuck on some part of the environment and expend all your arrows on them. You maintain eye contact while you do this. Really embarrass them. Piss on them if you can. Be careful that you don't also get stuck in environments. Can't tell you how many times I just stepped on the wrong end of a portal. There's a surprising amount of puzzle work in Arx Fatalis, and I think they run the gamut as far as adventure game puzzles go. Some are an enjoyable challenge and others expect a lot of you. Expect a lot of your real life perception and intelligence. There's a treasure hunt side quest that has you following a bunch of vague clues left on notes scattered around arcs and how you could figure this out on your own is beyond me. It's, it is beyond big brain time. But there are a few that are honestly not that difficult, but clever enough that I felt a sense of accomplishment in figuring them out. Sometimes I feel like my mind is attuned to the way adventure game puzzles work, and other times I'll sell or throw away quest items that are required to complete the game, and I have to rewatch all the footage of my entire playthrough to retrace my steps and find out when I had disgraced myself, and then shamefully run back to all those areas to retrieve them, taking solace in the fact that at the very least nobody has to know that I did something so dumb. What? Wait a second.
Get down to business. Functioning as a mini puzzle mechanic all its own is Arx Fatalis' unique spellcasting system. Spells are learned by collecting runes, which have a magic word on them. You match a rune with a few others, and you can cast a spell provided your level is high enough. You enact this by either memorizing, or more reasonably, obsessively checking your spellbook and drawing the symbols on the runes with your cursor. Since this isn't always convenient to do mid-action, you can pre-cast a few of them, essentially drawing the symbols and then chambering them for instant use. This is a wildly inventive touch, especially for its time, and I think a key part of what distinguishes Arx Fatalis from similar games, though you really do have to put in some effort to learn how to draw these things as it's not very forgiving. There are certain runes I just I could never nail down. There is a wide variety of spells and a ton of different ways you could approach combat and stealth using them. For me, invisibility and incinerate were invaluable, certainly in defeating enemies like the Ilsids. The first couple times I accidentally stumbled on one, I'd assumed this was the game gatekeeping me from progressing to an endgame area, but really you just have to get clever with all your spells and abilities. There was one sequence where I needed to use this lever to raise a gate, but just touching it immediately set me on fire and killed me, and the best solution might have been to use telekinesis to pull it at a distance, but I didn't have the stats to use that, so I settled on giving myself a fire shield so I could at the very least limp away from touching it alive. The variety of ways an obstacle can be overcome is really impressive for much of the game, but there are segments later on that feel sort of forced into linearity and honestly feel kind of cheap. The dwarven area feels like a band-aid over something, with a frustrating trial and error chase sequence in place of just a cool area to explore and fight monsters in. If you choose to use a build that does not have some points in spellcasting, you can still find and buy magic scrolls so you can manage, but I feel like you would be missing out on one of the more creative and fun aspects of the game. I initially tried to focus my character on stealth, but I don't think it's the most developed skill. There isn't much to it that feels like a payoff until late in the game. At first I got excited because I saw that thing at the bottom which looks like the light gem from Thief, but that actually just shows how powerful your attack's gonna be. And the way stealth actually works is kind of mysterious and uh, mostly worthless unless you want to pickpocket people. A lot of older reviews criticize the game's hunger mechanic and think of it as not much more than an annoyance because of the frequency that Amshigar needs to eat or just because it's a holdover from older RPGs. Maybe this has been addressed in patches that came about in the years in between, but I legitimately didn't remember this being a mechanic in the game at all until like halfway through this playthrough. I'm hungry. Hey, you, you do that? There's a decent amount of food you can cook and prepare should you feel so inclined, but like potion making, it's easy to pass over this function entirely. I barely noticed hunger because I was just hoovering up any food I came across. Sucking mushrooms out of the dirt, dude. I don't even know why I was doing it half the time. Maybe I assumed Dom Shigar also had an unfillable void, ready to be stuffed with garbage. Speaking of garbage, for reasons beyond me, the first time I played both Arx Fatalis and Morrowind, for that matter, was on a console. I have no idea how that winded up being the circumstance, so I was morbidly curious how the game functions on Xbox, because in playing it on PC, it's a lot for my brain to remember. There's a lot of functions and commands, but we're on a PC where that is the most easy to deal with. And I was routinely in shock that I got through this with a controller. So I popped this fucker in and... This is an Xbox. Obviously, visually it takes a dive, looking darker and muddier, and most of the assets look real low res, and the presence of big, stupid Xbox buttons everywhere is a bit unseemly, but I think it makes some interesting choices in translating to console. One choice I do like is that the inventory and character loadout is combined on one big grid screen, which I much prefer to the tiny grid at the bottom of the PC version, where I would constantly misclick and throw an item into the stratosphere when I just wanted to move it to a different space. You do have an inventory wheel that is controlled with the D-pad, which serves as a quick access to your inventory so you can sort of have it both ways. Jump is left trigger, which is bizarre and I hate it, but the biggest difference is how spellcasting works. You use the directional buttons like you're doing a combo in a fighting game, but pointing in the direction you would draw the rune. So like Alm, which is the basic first one you get. It's just a line that starts from left to right, so in this case, you would just press right. It's kind of an elegant solution, but I feel like I'd be less likely to remember the spells for some reason. It feels like there's an extra layer of processing that needs to take place in my head uh, that's just enough to short circuit it. It gets overwhelmed really easily with complicated button layouts that I can't read and controllers that go all wibbly wobbly like I'm just trying to play the fun rat game.
Okay, don't gotta give me a 4D experience. Look, I'm not one of these elitist gatekeeping gamers that's gonna whine about how they don't make them like that anymore. But seriously, you guys? They don't make them like that. I'm easily enamored by older game design. Nice. And Arx Fatalis is no exception. It's still a lovely looking game, and it's got some quirk to it as well. I could compare it visually to something like Thief, or Morrowind, or Kingsfield 4, but it's got such a clearly defined vibe of its own. It's got a lot of the stiff animation and chunkiness of a game from the early 2000s, but it's also got some pretty impressive lighting and textures. I'm in love with NPCs' faces. They look almost like photos of actors' faces placed on blocky puppets. This is another circumstance where I feel like what I just said was a criticism but it wasn't. I actually love their faces very genuinely because I'm in an emotional wreck at the moment and I don't know where to aim that. I give this game a lot of points for its body awareness. I love being able to look down and see how disgusting I am. Every level of arcs is really atmospheric and is surprisingly distinguishable from each other. You'd think with a color palette that is mostly gray and brown, it would all kind of blur together into an insufferable maze, but there's a lot that differentiates what level you're on and who lives there. I did experience some odd visual glitches like certain textures being stretched into oblivion during cutscenes. Sometimes the screen would flash a solid color for some reason. I can only assume it's a thing that's going to vary from person to person and is probably a result of the game being optimized for modern machines. I don't have the strength to check modern reviews of this game yet, but I imagine its voice acting probably got a lot of shit. Sweeberis, what can you tell me about the rituals? Do you know who killed Fallon Orbiplanix? Really, I don't know what you're talking about. Comrades, fight to the death! Enough. No more bloodshed. It is admittedly sort of stilted and awkward, but that's almost never been a turn off for me. Most of the time a game has quote unquote bad voice acting, it just sort of ascends to good in a different sense. I mean, I appreciate professional grade voice acting for sure, but something like this, it's unique. It's the result of a particular alchemy that you can't recreate. It's special, I think. Hello? I think the sound design is wonderful. It's a big part of what I love about this game's atmosphere. The way everything is drenched in cavernous reverb, from your jangling footsteps to dripping water, the scurrying of rats or a guard having a coughing fit a few yards away. It's a wonderfully cold and ghostly world. I especially liked these medieval air ducts that presumably you would need to provide oxygen down here. The distant whistling you hear next to these is really nice. Some games just don't appreciate how much idle guard banter makes or breaks a game for me. <laughs> Next time I see him, I'll tell him what I really think. I need bored, dopey sounding guards to bitch about how boring their job is. Otherwise, I'll get so de-immersed I'm gonna scream. The best is the goblins, who, as well as having the bored dialogue, will sing chaunty little songs to themselves. -da -da -da, da -da -de -de, da -da. They're just so precious. It's a shame I had to eviscerate so many of them. It's not without its odd missteps, of course. I noticed that everyone has the same yawn sound effect, regardless of character model. <sighs> what should I do? And that's like the best I could come up with as far as criticism. So that should tell you that I, I like the way this game sounds. I think you really get to soak up the game's audio <laughs> thanks to the fact that there is very little music in it. And what music there is, is very understated. It's mostly ambience. They function more like sound palettes that are tangled up in the natural sounds you'd hear in this kind of location. It's almost diegetic in this way. Each level getting its own distinct assortment of creepy, echoey noises. It's, it's downright perfect. I feel like the closest the soundtrack gets to conventional song structure is the song that plays in the yellow tulip bar, and even that sounds like it's some tragic memory in a half-remembered dream. This is what it sounds like when the sun has died, and everything's falling apart, and you're just trying to pretend that it isn't by making friends with a goblin because that dog outside's giving you nothing. 
has not aged well, sadly. With the innovation Arx Fatalis brought to the RPG table, it's a damn shame it has not aged well. The reason being is, all the ideas Arcane Studios formed with Arx Fatalis have been overshadowed by their latest game, Dark Messiah. It's hard to go back to a studio's previous work when their newest offering is the same price and 10 times better. So for me, Arx Fatalis was great when it came out, but Dark Messiah brings a dark shadow to this old dungeon crawler and smashes the support beams. Look all due respect to the kick game, kick but I don't see that game aspiring to be Arx Fatalis but better. Its ethos seems so different to the point where this comparison seems pointless. Whenever a developer I like puts out a new game, I don't think, oh boy, now I can't play anything else they've made, what's the point? Maybe it's the result of people playing games, you know, that just update every year, so it's like, well, why would I play the last one? Because there's a new one that's the same game, but prettier. But don't you have, like, nostalgia? What, are you complacent with the present? Like some kind of psycho? Gameplay is long and slow moving. While it has okay graphics, the play experience is by far the worst I have ever had. Gameplay is long is an interesting complaint. It is kind of slow, but you can use spells to really zip around if you want. I don't think that's entirely what they were going for though. I think they wanted you to take your time exploring and absorbing the world. So maybe it's just not the kind of game for you. You are very fortunate. I think that this is the worst experience you've had in gaming. You haven't had to watch Kingdoms Fall, Stars Burn Out, you just had to play a game that is slower than other games you've played. Despite promising aspects like cooking, this came out to be an extremely boring Morrowind wannabe. This is an odd insult to lob at Arx Fatalis as there were six months in between the release of it and Morrowind, so if they were aspiring to be a Morrowind clone, which they weren't, they must have had to act real quick during that period. This is the burden that comes with being a huge fan of Morrowind as I am. It's, it's fandom is full of fuckers like this. <laughs> Not like Morrowind. All the reviews I read before buying Arx Fatalis said it was like Morrowind, just with worse voice acting. But it is much more than just bad voice acting. The game overall feels dry and boring. Pull out your old Morrowind disc and play it again instead. See, what did I say? Steam has Arx Fatalis for $4.99. Granted, it has no DRM here, as well as the rest of the goodies, but it's only fair to point out that it's currently $5 more from GOG. How is that a fair point? You just said you're getting more shit! That usually costs more money! So why don't you buy it on Steam, Steam boy? You know what the best part of Morrowind was? The caves. Just ask Arcane Studios CEO Raphael Colantonio. Umlauts are the new goatee, though Raphael has both. Early on in designing Arx Fatalis, he realized that nobody wants to traipse about a large open world filled with a variety of races, creatures, mountains, and trees. No, no, they want to wade through caves, stabbing a dozen or so generic types of enemies for hours on end with none of that pesky variety to get in the way. Of course, they didn't keep him from totally ripping off every other aspect of Morrowind but at least he stuck with the whole caves idea. But why stop at ripping off an excellent first person RPG when you can also include a totally cliched plot to go along with it? Whereas schlock literature leans on the opening phrase, it was a dark and stormy night, to warn the reader that they're about to ingest a totally derivative plot, crappy video games usually wave the red flag by starting you naked, imprisoned, and amnesiac. Quiet, here comes the guard. You hear that? The gods are coming. When you begin your game and, right on cue, your befuddled, loincloth-clad avatar awakens on the dirty floor of his tiny jail cell, feel free to curl up for a totally unoriginal game. Don't worry about being impressed later on, you won't be. There's a lot more wankery to this review that I don't give a fuck about. Uh, it's really bizarre that more than one person would accuse Arx Fatalis of ripping off a game when their development cycles, you know, overlapped. And it's so clearly not using Morrowind or the Elder Scrolls world as an inspiration because it wears its inspiration on its sleeve and it's a franchise that predates Elder Scrolls. Like, I get it. You like Morrowind, it's an amazing game, but this does not invalidate or diminish the creations of others, especially the first output of a small dev team. Elder Scrolls put in the work. There were four games and a decade of world building to get to Morrowind. It didn't come out the amazing. Like a lot of things I wind up loving, Arx Fatalis is an imaginative and well-realized game with a lot of divisive qualities to it, a lot of ideas that would soon be eclipsed or were already deemed outdated, a lot of bugs, a lot of crashes, a lot of abandoned ideas. It's a shame it didn't sell better, and it's a shame it had to come out so soon after fucking God's gift to humanity or whatever. It's, it's not like Morrowind. But you know what else isn't like Morrowind? 
anything. It's a smaller, thinner, less well-balanced experience that began life as an advancement of old-school dungeon crawlers and then wound up finding its own unique voice. It was released in an odd, transitory period in gaming that caused it to age more rapidly than other games, it seems. There's a lot that's unintuitive about Arx Fatalis, for sure. It certainly represents the death rows of games that put an inordinate amount of faith in the player to read and learn about how the game works. So if you were to play it for the first time now, it's likely you'll need to consult some kind of guide or a scan of the manual, which not even that really seems to deep dive into all the things you can actually do, which I front like I don't get, but I get. It's more and more a big ask, you know, to dump research onto a game. Like, you just want to play a game. I have my cutoff point as well, where I guess to some extent I could say this game is too old for me to play. You you're not going to catch me playing Ultima 1. You call that a rat? I don't know about that, buddy. I just think there's still a lot to appreciate about this game. Despite there being games that came after it that, sure, were more fun to play. Do they got rats like this, though? That's a great rat right there. There is still a great deal of charm as well as challenge to its gameplay. Its story hints at something interesting, but doesn't really have the time to get into it. I could easily see how sequels could have expanded it, but due to their trouble finding a publisher and draining resources, they instead chose to funnel time and money into the development of Kick technology, which did pay off in its own right. Either way, it all worked out. Arcane and Bethesda are technically under the same roof now, and after Dishonored, they've finally got some good momentum going. It's a nice enough slice of throwback fantasy, but it's mostly carried by the tone and atmosphere of arcs. That's why I came back to it, and why I remember it. I remember the dank, I remember the rats. You know, that review was right. What that angry video game nerd said, not that one. What he said about the caves may have been sarcastic, but I am here because of the caves, and it's a big reason why I like Morrowind. What is that game if not the game where you find cool caves? And this whole game's a cool cave. If you like caves, this is a must play. Essential gaming. If you're neutral on caves, I don't know, stop it. You've reached the end of the video. Thank you for watching it. I hope you enjoyed it. It is also brought to you by the early 2000s era Hot Topic font. Uh, if you enjoyed the video, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe. In the description, there are links to my Twitter, uh, Discord, merchandise, uh, uh, Patreon. And if you are already a patron, thank you so much for your support. And uh, you mean the world to me. And I, I, I don't, I don't know what I would do without you. <coughs> Just probably hire somebody to kick me into a spike wall. I already read the credits for February in the last video, so I will get you in the next one. Uh, where hopefully my energy will be a little less weird. But I hope you know I still appreciate you. Okay, bye. Uh -oh.